Ah, the race for U.S. president, providing the world with an endless source of meme material. But what are the real-life implications of the lies being spread? I'm Annelise Borges, and this is The Stream. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. Eat the cat. Eat, eat, the, eat the cat. Eat, eat the cat. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. Eat the cat. Eat, eat the cat. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cat. From eating cats and dogs to deportation and bomb threats, comments by U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump and his running mate, J.D. Vance, have appended life for a community trying to make Springfield, Ohio, their new home. Haitians fleeing gang violence and a failed state have now been dealing with xenophobia and racism. How much has social media contributed to this? And what can be done to counter such narratives? Joining me to discuss are Vincent Wells, an immigration lawyer with Chris Ohio, a nonprofit that works with refugees and immigrants in the state. Saud Moon, executive director of Dear Asian Youth, an organization focused on promoting solidarity with marginalized communities. And Michidael Francois, organizing director of the Florida Student Power Network and herself a Haitian American. As we said at the start, there was no shortage of memes following Donald Trump's infamous cats and dogs soundbite. But here's one resident of Springfield, Ohio, helping us set the tone of today's conversation. I know many of you are finding the news coming out of Springfield, Ohio to be hilarious and meme worthy, but I will tell you living here, it is anything but funny. What is happening in our community groups is a level, level of vitriol and nationalism that I have never seen. I find it important to tell you that there are definitely people causing a lot of problems here in Springfield, but it's the people who look like me. The people threatening violence on our community are white. Uh, we do struggle with all the things that any city struggles with. We do have homeless people. We do have crime, but this is not a result of immigration. This is a result of us not being able to keep our eyes on the ball. Michelle, I would like to start with you, if that's okay. As a Haitian American, can you talk to us about how the community of Haitians have been feeling since those comments were made? Yes, definitely. Um, since um, what has um, happened um, in Springfield, Ohio, um, I think the reaction of Haitian immigrants across the country um, has been um, disgust as well as embarrassment, right? Mm -hmm. um, for the past few years, we've realized um, that our community and our people um, is always at um, the center of conversations when it comes to um, immigration as well as um, elections. Um, this happened in 2016 when um, our country was named among countries that were not worthy of migrating to the United States. And then with this upcoming um, presidential election, we see the same pattern and trends happening. Um, but what folks don't don't realize is that um, this has really bad impact. The memes, the jokes, um, it all um, causes trauma um, as well as um, embarrassment for folks who are part of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it's a sentiment across the board that um, as a community, you know, we um, can contribute and have been contributing to the United States, its mm -hmm. economy. Um, as well as the culture, right? Mm. Um, but yet again, like our country and then as well as our contributions mm. um, are walked over um, and not um, given importance. It's um, a very important point, and uh, we will discuss more about the contributions um, a little later, but disgust and embarrassment, these are very poignant feelings and, and very harsh, um, I would say, um, a harsh reality. Vincent, you've been working with asylum seekers, with people traveling to the United States, seeking a better life for many years. I, I, I was wondering if you could explain to us what is the logic here and why would Donald Trump and his running mate target the Haitian community right now? Why Haitians? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak on, um, on uh, Donald Trump's direct comments, but I can say um, 
the Haitian community um, has been migrating here for years. Um, and I think that when we look at Ohio specifically, um, they're migrating to Ohio because there's opportunity in Ohio, mm-hmm. uh, there's jobs in Ohio. Um, and so it's understandable um, that with change, um, there can be a little bit of confusion and misguidance. And I think that's what's happened here um, in Ohio specifically. I think that um, misinformation has really um, caused a lot of harm to our community and our Haitian immigrants that are here in the state of Ohio. Um, and I think that if we really look at the facts, um, you can see how much of a contribution um, they've had to our communities, how um, resilient the community is, um, and most importantly, that they're here um, working legally. Um, and I mean, there's just a lot um, that can be said positively about the community. Mm. It's just really, really sad, isn't it? So, I mean, eating pets, how, how does this kind of idea even um, catch traction? How much has social media to do with this? Yeah, well, we saw this conversation starting off on social media. I, I think that the algorithms that we currently have do kind of like benefit this sort of hate that we kind of have been seeing. Mm-hmm. And we saw this conversation starting on Twitter or X that we've been calling it now, where we saw this like cats and dogs rhetoric being spread and it just caught like fire. We saw like posts that got millions of views of people spreading this inflammatory language and it was all, all just a lie. It's very interesting how this probably kind of happened a few years ago, but this just seems a reality of social media. Mm. And it also shows just how much more, I don't know, hatred we've seen spread on on X in the last, especially in the last two years, I would say. Um, Mishidael, we've we've spoken about um, Haiti for, I would say, a few years now for all the wrong reasons. So much has happened to the country, right? I mean, I've been there reporting several times and it was never good news, unfortunately. Um, Can you paint a picture to our viewers now of what these people that have been seeking refuge in the US, what are they fleeing from? Yes, definitely. And I know like um, folks who probably keep um, tabs on what's currently happening um, in Haiti probably know about the migration patterns of folks um, immigrating to the United States. Um, For the past two years, a lot of folks who have been coming to the United States from Haiti um, came from the humanitarian parole program, otherwise known as the Biden program. And so they have been migrating legally to the United States, fleeing um, a lot of chaos, um, as well as instability that has plagued the country since the assassination um, of Jovenel Moise um, and with um, gangs, you know, making it unsafe for folks um, to be in Haiti, um, more than the hundreds of thousands of folks um, have left the country in search of a better life in the United States. Um, and I think it's important for us to contextualize that and name that right, um, because since all of this has been happening um, in the United States, Haitians are continuing to be deported. Um, folks. Um, are not given the care that is needed um, or um, given um, the support that is needing, needed given um, what's currently happening um, in the country. Um, and as these folks are migrating, right, legally through the Biden program and other pathways, right, um, I think it's really important that we embrace these folks in our community and give the support that's really needed for them to integrate fully. You made a very interesting statement there. You're saying so many of these Haitians are actually coming through a program. They're coming legally. Vincent, I wanted your take here because there's a lot that is said about just how easy it is for these people to come in and steal the jobs or live off of benefits. Um, The life of an asylum seeker, of someone that is starting life again, is just so much harder than that. Can you explain what these folks go through to try to start again? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, what we've heard a a lot recently um, is describing these individuals as undocumented. And I think um, what's difficult about the word undocumented is that there's a literal definition and there's a legal definition. And the literal definition makes you think that um, these people do not have documents. um, And that's just not the case. Uh, Many of them are covered in many different ways through legal programs and legal entry to the United States. 
Um, one way is through the humanitarian parole program, um, which requires um, vetting before entry to the United States. Um, again, U.S. then is informed of, of the entry. They know the individual is in the United States. Um, upon entry, um, depending on when an individual entered the United States in humanitarian parole, they may be um, uh, able to qualify for additional protections through temporary protected status, which was just redesignated in June of this year. Um, and it makes an additional 300,000 Haitians um, who entered through the humanitarian parole program um, uh, uh, qualify for temporary protected status. Um, and on temporary protected status, you can work legally. Um, you're also prevented from being deported from the United States. Um, these are all things that uh, people don't understand when you hear the term undocumented immigrant. Um, you think these are individuals that are born across the border who have never been stopped by um, Border Patrol. We don't know who they are, and that's just not the case. Mm. Um, Saud, your organization, uh, Dear Asian Youth, was founded when Asians were going through something similar in terms of being thrown into the spotlight um, and facing dehumanization and xenophobia. Can you share with us mm -hmm. the history and, and why your foundation was created? Yeah, so our organization was founded in 2020. And as we all know, that was the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And around then, uh, the previous president, Donald Trump, was spreading the language calling COVID-19 the Chinese virus or calling it Kung flu or something like that. And that sort of language did spread like divisive and hateful rhetoric towards East Asians. And as a result, of our organization was founded. It's called Dear Asian Youth. And we were created as a community for a community like East Asians who were feeling this sort of xenophobia and this sort of hateful rhetoric. We were seeing all around the country hate crimes and sort of threats towards the East Asian community. And connecting this to what's happening to Haitians now, we've seen bomb threats happening in, in Springfield and evacuations and all that too. This sort of rhetoric leads to dangerous situations for people. It's not just online. It's not just something that happens in conversations. It impacts impacts people's lives, and it's made people feel genuinely very unsafe. Absolutely. And it seems to be also an interesting distraction, isn't it, from some of the real issues. Uh, Michidael, I wanted to ask you about your view on this. How much of what is being blamed on migrant communities in this particular discussion um, is actually more linked to institutional failures, not only in the context of Ohio, but in other parts of the country as well. Yes, and, and I'm so happy that you asked this question because um, at the organization um, that I'm at, Florida Student Power, um, we believe in um, ensuring that there is a pathway to citizenship um, for all undocumented folks and folks um, who are vulnerable immigrants. Um, and I think um, this conversation highlights um, the reason why more than ever before, we need to fix the broken immigration system that currently exists um, within the United States. Um, I think it was highlighted before in the conversation, all of the different pathways folks can um, go into um, to get documented, right? However, um, those are all temporary um, solutions and does not um, fix the problem of ensuring that there is a pathway to citizenship that protects and humanizes the folks who are migrating um, to the United States. I mean, I think, right, like it's easy for us to hop on TikTok or to hop on any social media platform and see the rhetoric, but they do have real world impacts. Mm. Um, the trauma that many of the children of these folks will face, right, in terms of like going to school and hearing this harmful rhetoric, right, um, de definitely makes these communities and makes my people feel unsafe. And so, I think next steps in the conversation as we're having, uh, as we're seeing all of this information come through is how can we secure um, a pathway to citizenship for all folks who are vulnerable immigrants so that they can feel safe in the U.S.? Hmm. In the nation of immigrants. I mean, Vincent, can we talk about the positive impact of immigration on the economy? On our pre-interview, you actually cited that Pew Research report saying that immigrants have contributed with $128 billion in tax revenue in the U.S., which is more than the tax revenue of the entire state of Ohio. Why are things like that not being talked about? Well, I think that's because there's been misinformation. And I think that if you look at the economic impact of immigrants, um, immigrants are oftentimes saving the economy in the United States. 
Um, there's a new report out um, by a nonpartisan entity that's looked at the next decade, and they've uh, stated that they believe that due to increased immigration, um, immigrants will continue to contribute over $7 trillion um, in boosting the economy of the United States over the next decade. I also think if you look at um, Social Security and unemployment um, programs that uh, individuals who are not U.S. citizens pay into when working in the United States, but don't get the benefit of. Um, so, for instance, if you're a Haitian uh, immigrant on temporary protected status, you may be on temporary protected status for, for years, paying into Social Security programs that you'll never be able to take advantage of unless you become a citizen. Um, and as the previous speaker said, um, right now, there's not a clear pathway for citizenship for so many individuals coming into the United States who have obtained temporary protected status, who are here on humanitarian parole. Mm. Um, these classifications have been around for multiple decades. Um, and individuals have been living here, may call in the United States their home. Uh, many of these are our neighbors that you would have no idea um, do not have permanent status in the United States. And creating a pathway towards citizenship is just so important mm. um, in humanizing these individuals. Uh, Saud, your take here on how important it is also to change the narrative and to talk about these positive contributions that immigration uh, has on the economy and on all aspects of society, to be fair. Yeah, no, I mean, we all know this. Immigration is something that generally does benefit all economies. In the case of Springfield, Springfield was a declining population. And mm -hmm. with Haitians coming in, the estimates were about twelve to 15,000 immigrants. They boosted the economy. And what we've known from immigrants is that immigrants generally do tend to work harder than others, even though that does perpetuate some sorts of you know, common stereotypes. It is true that people who are, you know, in more difficult like situations as immigration will have to, when they come to new areas, they generally will have to take the jobs that they're going to get and they'll get, they're going to take jobs that might be open. And that does boost and benefit economies. What we've seen throughout the history of the United States is that immigrants have helped the United States. It's the foundation of this country. It's what's been, you know, what people have taught us throughout this country. Absolutely. And unfortunately, we've seen this rhetoric been divided, but we certainly need to see a change in that. Uh, Michidela, I wanted your take here as well. Um, how can you change the narrative? You, you were just talking about something that actually really moved me, these children going to school and potentially being laughed at because they are of Haitian origin and maybe they have pets. I don't know. I can't even think of the jokes that were made here. Um, but I can imagine the trauma, how important it is for this generation to fix this narrative and, and how can it be done? And, and that's a, a very difficult question in terms of like how we can fix the narrative. But I think the first step, right, is owning our impact and realizing that there is impact um, when these things happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's easy for us, and I think we talked about it earlier, for us to hop on social media platforms, laugh and kind of like memify the situation, right? Um, but for folks who are going through it um, and for folks who are part of this community, it isn't a joke. It isn't a quick laugh. It isn't a quick double tap on your phone. Um, it's their real lives. And I think um, the coverage of the bomb threats and folks being afraid um, to send their children to school is testament to the impact that can happen from these statements. Mm -hmm. And then when folks see um, folks who are um, contending for um, the highest place in the executive branch, um, the presidency and the vice presidency, right? Um, to um, They're the ones who are spreading this hateful rhetoric is very harmful. And so the actions that have to come and result from this is how can we ensure that our leaders um, are not spewing hateful rhetoric that kind of impacts our communities? And how are we banding together to ensure that we're protecting each other? I mean, mm -hmm. also centering humanity, which is a huge component, ensuring that we're seeing each other um, as the community members and humans that we are, and we're not um, traumatizing, spreading misinformation, mm -hmm. um, and, and um, putting folks in situations to where they can't um, continue on from those traumatic conversations. Yeah, because this is not only about creating buzz to win an election, it's about polarizing a nation, and then how can you govern after this? I mean, um, in terms of where to now, here's more on Donald Trump's concepts of a plan. I can say this, uh, we will do large deportations from Springfield, Ohio. 
large deportations. We're going to get these people out. We're bringing them back to Venezuela. The real threat is what's happening at our border because you have thousands of people being killed by illegal migrants coming in and also dying. You have women dying as they come up. They're coming up in large groups. We call it a caravan. I think I came up with that name, but it's really what it is. 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 people. And you have large numbers of women being killed in those caravans coming up to this country. Vincent, when Donald Trump speaks of mass deportations, is that even legal? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the, at the law, right, when you talk about is it possible to deport 11 million people that are classified as undocumented, the simple answer is no. It's not possible under the current federal rules. Um, temporary protected, protected status prevents individuals from being deported from the United States. As of March of this year, there were 900,000 people on temporary protected status from 16 different countries. We know for a fact that those 900,000, unless something changes with the temporary protected status, are not permitted, as long as they stay in status, to be deported from the United States. Um, and we also know that they're considered in the class of undocumented people that count towards the 11 million. So when you say um, we're going to deport, you know, undocumented immigrants, well, you have to understand that there's certain undocumented immigrants that are just prevented from being deported at this time, um, including many of the one, uh, immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, many of the Haitians who have now fall under the new classification of the, du of the June um, temporary protected status uh, start date. Um, again, that encompasses an additional 300,000. In March of this year, um, there were 200,000 approximately Haitians on temporary protected status, and we expect that number to go up significantly. Mm. Saud, we have a couple more weeks still of campaign in the U.S. The rhetoric, I mean, we've, we've been seeing it and it's, it's just, it's not positive. It's, it's one of division and, and hatred and false information. What else should we expect? What else should we brace for when it comes to these final steps of the race here? Yeah. I just think that this is going to be the playbook. And what we've seen is that hate and this sort of rhetoric is just going to be what we're going to see from this election. And I'm worried for communities across the U.S. We've seen what's happened to Haitians. We've seen what happened to other communities. And we see that a certain political party does benefit from setting this sort of hateful rhetoric. So I do think we as marginalized communities need to come together. Um, I think that we need to have solidarity with the Haitian community and make it clear that we stand with them because what's happening right now is traumatic and it's very difficult. So in these situations, we as a community need to stand strong and I'm very proud to see the like the solidarity that we've been seeing in Springfield from the Haitian community. Mm. Michelle, one last um, question for you. Um, what would be your message today to the Haitian community, but also to other communities, um, as uh, Saoud just mentioned there, uh, in terms of, of coming together and, and, and standing shoulder to shoulder in these difficult times? Yes, I think um, the overall conversation or overall message um, that I want to come forth from this is that um, we do have to come together to fight for a more definite um, pathway towards um, citizenship. I think that is our North, North Store when it comes to um, immigration. And in terms of like other communities, I'm um, just banding together to ensure um, that we name that and that we continue fighting towards that. Mm -hmm. um, because we know um, our actions do have um, consequences. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, this year is an election year, right? We saw what happened in 2016, we saw the results Deportations skyrocketed um, during um, the past, um, not this current presidency, but the past presidency. And we just saw a video that committed um, towards that same um, kind of action um, if they were to become president. So I think it's really important for all of our communities to come together, um, to think of our actions when it comes to the ballot box and ensure that we're standing in solidarity with one another and also fighting um, towards that pathway of citizenship that would protect so many people across our different communities. Michidel, Vincent and Saud, thank you all so much for being part of the stream today. And thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to stay in touch with us on social media. You can use the hashtag or the handle 
AJ stream to send us your questions and suggestions and we will look into them. Take care and I'll see you soon.